Tough Africa Global presents the first Eco Smart City in the Gambia, the Tough City, located between Gunjur and Sifo. It is 30 minutes away from the Banjul International Airport. At Tough City, you will be able to live, work, play, and shop in a healthy multi-purpose community. This vibrant urban environment will meet your everyday needs with commercial, business, recreational and other complementary services to increase the value of your home. With up to 5,000 units of affordable homes on a 500 hectare land, Tap City will be twice the size of Banjul. Prime location, stunning properties and amazing discount of 20% for the first 50 buyers. Make an appointment today to secure your property. For more information, please call plus 220-776233 or plus 220-376-2333 or you can send an email to info at toughafricaglobal.com. Better still, visit our office at Madiwa Mall, Brewfoot Gardens Estate. Tough City, a green and smart city accessible to all. Welcome back to the Tough Hub. My name is Maria Makuli and we are really excited to be back on this very important show. I'm here with the main host himself, Mr. Mustafa Njai, well known as Mr. Tough, uh, also youth man. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. <laughs> Welcome back, Mr. Njai. How are you? Thank you so much, Mariama. And uh, again, uh, it's a pleasure hosting the show with you. Um, it's always good to balance um, yes. from two directions yes yeah, one sure. gender wise we have a female and a male presenting it mm -hmm. and then from age wise also we have a youth man and a young lady you know yes. hosting it but trust me he's more of the youth man here <laughs> like the energy mr Jai has is not even matched with mine at all thank <laughs> you very much thanks for the great thank compliments <laughs> today we're here um uh, with um uh, somebody very young if you have been following the tough hop you will notice that most of the um, experts that we've been bringing into the hall are mainly uh, men and women of a bit of an age and a lot of experience. Mm -hmm. uh, but here we're, we're going, we have a guest, very knowledgeable in his own field, yes. but relatively very young. So I would like to introduce uh, Mr. Hassan Jallo. And Mr. Hassan Jallo will tell you who he is and give you a summary of your bio and also the business that you are in. Mr. Jallo, welcome. Welcome. Thank you very much. It's really an honor to be here. I remember being very, very pleased uh, when I received the invitation. Um, so my name is Hassan. I grew up in rural Gambia. I got access to the internet in 2006 um, and was hooked since. I run a leading software engineering company in the Gambia. We're on a mission to bring uh, meaningful technological innovations to the masses to improve the quality of life on the African continent. And um, we have a diverse team of engineers and designers that uh, build a variety of uh, cross-functional and cross-functional teams and cross-platform software solutions. So yeah. what's the name of your company? Again? Asutec. Asutec. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, you deal with a lot of technology, um, mm. Mr. Hassan. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us what is the role of technology in real estate? Oh, that's very interesting. I mean, you know, technology would affect every aspect of, of our lives, really. Mm -hmm. um, right now, if you look around, apart from nature, everything that you see, technology was involved in its production, either directly or indirectly. So for real estate, we have seen in many aspects of, um, in many aspects where technology has, has, uh, has positively impacted mm -hmm. the way we looked at real estate. The, one of the most notable ones would be, let's say, Airbnb, uh, what we thought about hotels, and Zillow, what we thought about how, to you, how do you actually get sales. But I think in the Gambia, one of the more interesting ways, especially in terms of sales, is how do you specifically target people who are more likely to buy a property. So if you, the, the traditional means of marketing uh, uh, 
uh, billboards and uh, radio adverts and television adverts are somewhat brute force. But how can you be very specific in terms of knowing the psychographic profile of the individual who is more likely to buy your property and targeting that psychographic profile in a more strategic way? Although, of course, there are some downsides to this because if a certain psychographic profile is targeted, um, a lot of people could be excluded which, uh, because there's already, the, the, the data already inher inherently has biases in it. For example, um, everybody, uh, having a home is it's a human right, right? Yes. So if you, if you look at data of people who purchased houses, you have a, you, let's say you have a, a list of 1,000 people, you can use that information to target 100,000 people who are more like that 1,000, mm. but it's very likely that um, people from underprivileged backgrounds or from certain uh, uh, geographic or demographic segments will be excluded in that data. So we should kind of find a way to proactively uh, close that gap. But I think in terms of acquisition and sales, technology will be one of the most effective. If you think about it, Google and Facebook, they're all products we use for free. It's not an accident why they are trillion dollar companies because they are a mechanism that is very powerful in generating sales especially with, with targeted ads. So I think, given the fact that I mentioned earlier that I used the internet for the first time in 2006, between 2006 and 2012, the internet access grew by 135%, right? Between, that's crazy, by the way. And this was before we were thinking about TikTok, WhatsApp, and all of this stuff, right? Between 2020 and 2021, it grew at, at around 23%. Obviously, COVID has something to do with it. Children have to now go to school online and everything. So the growth is massive. And if you think about it, more than 60% of our population are youth, which means every 10-year-old today will be 15 years in the next five years, and very likely to be online. And whatever data you contribute puts you in a particular psychographic segment, at least it makes you you, it subtracts you from the targeted psychographic segment because we already know this particular psychographic segment. So the potential is huge. We're just going to wake up one day and we realize the way we do user acquisition, the way we do sales is more strategic. To put it in simple terms, how this can work is this. You, you give me a bag with goods to sell and I walk the streets. So I can go all over the Gambia looking for somebody to sell a perfume, for example versus somebody gave me a thousand people and tells me based on the activities of these thousand people, they are very likely to buy a perfume. So it's more targeted and it's more specific. I think this is going to have a very massive impact in terms of sales of properties. Now, now Hassan, I mean, I, I've just noticed that you, there's a word that you've been repeating all the time, psychographic. Yeah. You know, at times, um, uh, you guys in the tech world, mm -hmm. you assume that everybody knows what is what. So let's mm -hmm. come down to the layman's language. Before we go further, what is psychography? Okay. So to explain it in layman terms is, you know, there are different kinds of market segmentation. So I wouldn't consider myself a professional in this space, but uh, there are different market segmentation. So you can do a geographic market segmentation, which means I want to sell something and I want to target people in Banjo for now. Or you can say demographic segmentation. I want to target people that are of a certain age. Or psychographic segmentation. I want to target people based on their activities and the things that they do and the things that they're interested in. Right? So that kind of, that is a psychographic representation of, um, of an individual. So based on the activities that they do, what their interests are, yeah. Okay, that, that's great. But, but now um, you've also mentioned um, uh, what, what, what you said on, on technology and real estate is mm -hmm. more focused on marketing. Yeah. It's more on marketing. Mm -hmm. But I would like to understand really mm -hmm. um, uh, technology in real estate as in the buildings themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, because we hear a lot mm -hmm. these days mm -hmm. um, about uh, smart cities which we are trying to build in, mm -hmm. in, 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 the, in Gunjur. Mm -hmm. The tough city is a smart city. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you say smart, I know and I assume it's technology. Right. So can we probably elaborate further, uh, not on the marketing aspect, but more on the buildings themselves, making it smart, and also 
in its role, technology is role, its role within real estate. Right. Yeah. Is there anything you can you can say about that? Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, it's quite interesting because I think when something is smart, it's it's able to 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 make its decisions and is able to make decisions based on data that it receives. I usually like to think of this in terms of what problem is it that we, you want to solve, right? Because there's a lot of stuff you can do with smart stuff, but specifically, let's talk about solar energy, for example. Um, if you want to transition to solar energy, in the Gambia especially, I think it's normally the way we think about it is you take, this is my Navic, now I'm transitioning to solar, you just remove the grid and just plug in solar, right? But the problem is when you transition to solar, the way you even think about electricity maybe it should be revised a little bit. Because it's not unlimited. It's power that is stored in batteries that will run out. So for example, you can make your household smart in a way that it efficiently uh, controls the consumption of electricity. For example, you can set up systems to ensure that your lights go off automatically when your, uh, the lights outside will go off automatically when it's sunrise, right? You can set up systems to make sure that your, uh, your fridge will turn off at 12 because nobody is going to open it and there's no sun at that time. You reserve the power until early in the morning when people wake up, it will just turn on automatically. So you conserve power. Um, you can set it such that when you're home, when you're in the bathroom, the lights just come on by themselves. You don't need, need to flip a switch. So, so as to avoid forgetting uh, turning off that switch. So in just an application, this, just this one simple application, you can be able to conserve a lot of electricity uh, in terms of the equipment, the equipment that you have in the household, and in terms of the convenience that it can create. So I always like to think of a problem to solve and work backwards to the technology. So when we think of, in the case of a smart city, we can say, okay, we want to use these technologies to make electricity consumption more efficient, right? So that's a problem to solve. And then we can use that to determine what we would, uh, what we would, what we would deploy. Maybe it could be convenience. Maybe you, want, you have a gated community, and then you want, um, you want people to be, you don't need to have an extra security to opening the door. So you can motorize the door and put in some mechanisms to ensure that it opens it for the right people, right? Something that rudimentary. So I think when we think of smart cities, we should think of it in the context of, okay, what are the problems that we would have in this city? And okay, this is the technologies that we can deploy. That's one. And then after that, the next layer is how do we provide an extra layer of convenience, especially in the household? How do you make sure that um, you can turn on your, your TV, your lights, and your air conditioning. How can you make sure that on your way home, your, home, your house knows that you're coming and it automatically cools down to, the, to, the, to, to your desired temperature, mm -hmm. right? So yeah. I think that could be interesting. Interesting, of course. Um, how is technology influencing the real estate industry? Right, so I think that, you know, and I think one of the... Uh, the most, the, the, the major disruptors of, of real estate, especially when it comes to rentals, um, the most well known is Airbnb, right? So the model, how, are you, how can you be able to rent out your, your property um, if you're not there and just somebody else can, can, can make that available. So that's one. And I think the next direction where I think it will be affected here, apart from business process automation. Like, how do you ensure that you're on top of everything that's happening? So when we speak about gamut specific, specifically, I think, how do you make sure there will always be snacks mm. in, in construction? It's unavoidable. But how do you make sure you have a system that can ensure that you are on top of these snacks, that you will be aware that there is a snack, and you can be aware of the resolution of that snag and the status of that snag. And it would auto, the snag would auto escalate if it has not been resolved for, 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 for a particular period. I mean, I mean, I imagine in the advanced world, this is pretty standard, right? But I think we should start outsourcing more of our thinking to the technologies. And then just having that give us the pointers of things that we need to zero in and check, us, check it off. 
Because otherwise, it would be almost impossible to be able to keep track of everything. But just let the technology tell you what to zero in on. And the other thing, I think, would be the sales, where we can be a bit more targeted in the sales. Mm -hmm. Because ultimately, it comes down to being able to sell, because that's how you can do more stuff to, uh, to, 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 to improve on what you have on, ongoing. I think apart from sales, also like advertisement. I mean, now uh, people use technology a lot to advertise their homes, their projects that they have, that they're building, the designs of their homes, in fact, mm -hmm. which I think is also very convenient. Yeah, that is correct. Um, that, that, is, that, is, that is absolutely correct. And, you know, there, there are also, um, uh, there's virtual reality. Mm -hmm where you can have a, you know, you can have, take a virtual tour of a particular property and somebody can go through that as if, you know, with a VR headset, it will feel as if you are in it. So that gives a more comprehensive feel of a property, especially if you're trying to sell to the diaspora, for example. Right. They get to see inside the property as if they were there. Mm -hmm. So it, 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 it gives a better visual of the property, you yeah. Yeah, um, most, most recently um, I have been uh, hearing about uh, PropTech. Yeah. Um, I, I guess uh, in most, most um, uh, fields or areas um, of business, mm -hmm. uh, there's now technology attached to it. Mm -hmm. As FinTech for finance, mm -hmm. you know, uh, which is quite very common now, mm -hmm. but most recently I've heard about PropTech. Uh, and not many people do hear about this. Mm -hmm. um, so can you, can you also further elaborate what, what, what is PropTech? Somebody says uh, PropTech. I, th I guess it's short, it's short for property technology or technology in property. Yes. So PropTech. So what is it to the layman? What is PropTech? Any piece of technology that is built to address the needs of the real estate industry is PropTech. That can be in many ways. It can be either in enhancing sales or in management of properties or even in valuations, etc. So there are many examples of properties like this. Some of them are in the business process automation space, or some of them are in providing value to the customers. Yeah. Great. Um, let's talk about the tough city. You know, we, we've gone out there and said uh, mm -hmm. that the tough city is uh, both smart and green. Mm -hmm. um, uh, to us, uh, mm -hmm. we're trying to appeal uh, to respond to mm -hmm. current demands of mm -hmm. technology. Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, these days, uh, people don't want to be holding keys to open their doors. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you can have a simple card to open everywhere, or mm -hmm. even fingerprints, fingerprints. Mm -hmm. you know, as you said. So uh, we're trying to catch up with the trend, what is mm -hmm. trending now in the world, to bring it into the Gambia. Mm -hmm. and that is why we want um, um, tough city to be a smart city, obviously mm -hmm. using technology. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but what role do you, do you see um, um, uh, that technology can play in the, in the tough city? What would you like to see happen in the tough city? But also being, being quite pragmatic. You okay. know, I know that most of us at times we want technology, 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 you know. Uh, but yes, it's in the Gambia and we want to have a smart city. Mm -hmm. uh, but from your own end, mm -hmm. as um, somebody in technology, you know, as a software developer, yeah. uh, what do you, what do you, what role do you think we can play? Technology, like technology can play mm -hmm. in the tough city. Yeah, that's quite a good question, and I also like, you know, how you put it that, you know, let it be pr pragmatic because there's a lot of things you can do. You can whistle and a door will open. That's not rocket science anymore. Mm. But that is why let's take a look at the problem. Let's say I lived in tough city, okay, and um, one of the things. What, do I, what would I do when I wake up? Um, how would my day look like? And what are some of the challenges that if I were to cut them down, it would just make me a bit more efficient or save me time or give me more convenience? So I understand that there are multiple gated communities in Tough City. And the gates will be closed, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes, the gates will be closed. So if that is the case, then we can have one thing. We can have somebody to come and open the gates or you can motorize the gates, which is pretty standard, right? How do you motorize the gates? And now you use sensors that the gates can detect this person is part of the community, and then it will open the gate. So that way, if I reach my community and I lived in Tough City, I don't have to uh, 
wait for somebody to open the gate or I don't have to get out of the car and go and open the gate, right? The other thing is how do you make sure automatically when you leave the house you don't have to go and switch off all the lights, right? So why can't the lights know that I am not in the house and they turn off by themselves, right? Um, how, do you get your, how do you get your house to know that you're on your way or you're in the house? that it automatically turns on the things that you, you would do, right? So you walk in the house, and before you walk in the house, let's say you walk in the house, um, the door, how do you make sure that you either use a, a key card or a fingerprint to open the door as opposed to having keys? And keys are expensive, right? Because you have five keys, you lose them, and you lose one. Or now, if you if there's five people in the household, one person is going to be there without a key, right? And you can go re replicate it, but if it's a key card, if the keys are lost, you just disable the key and en enable a new key. If it's a fingerprint, well, you always have your finger, right? So then you don't have to worry about keys. And then you can also be able to know um, if, for example, you give access. You can give conditional access to some people. Maybe somebody who is supposed to uh, do some work in your house, you can give them conditional access to come in and do the work that they need to do and then leave and don't have access thereafter. Then the other thing is, there are certain places that whenever you are in there, there should be light. The bathroom should always have light. Maybe you typically like to brew coffee when you get home. Right? Why not you connect your uh, coffee machine um, into your automation system so that it automatically brews coffee? Um, if you like to watch the news whenever you get home, uh, why not the TV come on automatically and opens up your favorite channel and gives you a summary of the news? Right? Um, uh, you, you have your alarm set at a particular time, right? Um, why not your alarm wakes you up and start brewing coffee? So I think it should be around what are the challenges that people go through. So, for example, at work we have something like this. We, we change a lock to an RFID pad lock because we had keys and the keys get lost. And, or sometimes we'll be at work, we'll be sitting down, and then it's dark all of a sudden. Uh, somebody has to wake up and go through the switch and turn it on. So we found a way that you can turn on the lights from either your phone via voice or otherwise. And then people say, okay, but why do I have to turn the light on? Why shouldn't the light come on themselves? So we put a PIR sensor um, on the ceiling so the lights will automatically come on when we're there and they will turn off when we go home. Mm -hmm. And the same goes for the AC and we just kept automating. We said, okay, when you leave the door, you have to push a switch. Uh, to open the door. So we have an RFID sensor that detects that somebody is standing in front of the door, the door opens and you just leave. So the reason why I'm saying that is that we just need to now understand uh, the needs of the people. The people who will be living in the city, what are the things that they do on a daily basis? And we just make living in the city like a breeze. <laughs> like it's unlike anything that you've used to because it will, everything that is supposed to be a headache for you, that is what it will solve. And then I think we can, you can, for example, start by observing your existing estates, which the Dalaba, really beautiful place, um, very clean. Um, observing what, how do people, how do, what are the challenges of the people? Okay, you wake up, what are the challenges that they have? Um, how is a typical household, what are the things that they do? Redundant tasks, because that's what technology is good at taking care of. What are the things that they're redundant that they have to do all the time? And then, okay, zero in on those, then you, you have minimal expense very high impact, as opposed to a lot of expense into a lot of nice to haves, where the impact is quite minimal. Now, all these beautiful things you were mentioning on technology, how it would just make life easy for you mm -hmm. and very smooth, I'm sure does come with its um, disadvantages as well. Mm -hmm. um, so, can you just elaborate on some of the advantages and disadvantages of technology, uh, specifically in the Gambia? Right. So I think, <clears throat> well, when it comes to what I have mentioned now, uh, I think that is one of the first concerns is the privacy concern. Mm. Because there is no system on earth that's 100% secure. Um, because if it's, if it's on a network, it can be broken. Yeah, it's on a network, it can be broken. And sometimes the weakest link is the human being. You know, it's more like stealing somebody's keys as opposed to breaking their doors. Mm. So, so that's, that's the, the primary concern is the main, the privacy concern is the main privacy one. You know, all of these corporations who build these systems uh, aggregating tons and tons of data of people. 
The other thing is the security concern that you can get hacked, and especially you have a security camera indoors. Mm -hmm. It has a vulnerability on you, maybe your DVR, and somebody is looking at it and invading your privacy. So these are uh, the two the, the two main concerns that uh, the, the two main concerns for for this kind of stuff. And when it comes to technology in Gambia in general, I think you know the the broad term is fake news, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, you know, where people would just share stuff without verifying it. Mm. You just hear some story. You know, I mean, like they, they, there's a news, there's a common saying in media, if it, if it bleeds, it leads, right? Um, yeah, when something is controversial, you know, it has more activity. You know, people have more comments, there's more share, there's more comments. And then the algorithms of these platforms, the social media platforms are optimized to to propagate stuff like that. So this may be something good, right? Um, that has happened and everybody is proud. Maybe the Scorpions won, yeah. or one of the Scorpions did something great. And every, so the algorithms will share it, right? Um, or it's something terrible, me, which most likely is not true. But, you know, somebody, it's controversial, and then people just keep sharing. So I think we should, and this is not a question of technology. This is a question of people taking responsibility. Like you don't share stuff that you can't validate its authenticity, right? Um, no, all kinds of stuff. So sometimes you have half truths that are mixed with a lot of stuff. But and those still part of the disadvantages. I mean, are we not concerned here about the internet quality that we have in the Gambia? You know, sometimes. Well, you can automate your house and have everything connected to the internet. You come home and there's no internet. Like, we had those moments in mm -hmm. Gambia where mm -hmm. we have internet blackout. Mm -hmm. um, in situations like that, how do you expect to go about your day or even have access to your house if the internet that is probably supporting to control those facilities is not available? Excellent question. These are concerns and things really we should be concerned about. It's, it's unthinkable that we would have internet downtime for a whole country, but yet it happened. Yeah. Um, my belief is that it's, it can only get better. Um, the internet situation is really going to get much better. We don't have a choice, we have to do that. Internet is now a human right. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of things that are happening now that makes me even more confident in that regard. And the other thing is that um, these technologies that we ship from abroad and we just fix them, they are designed for, with these kinds of things in mind. They imagine that internet should be there all the time, right? There shouldn't be internet downtime. Mm. And this is where companies, tech com local tech companies come in. This is where, this is our local setup. How do we localize this equipment in a way that it can accommodate for all of these inconsistencies and the challenges that we have? Mm -hmm. That way, even if something goes wrong, we have a contingency for it. So I think that you know, there are ways around it. That's the beauty of technology, because it's not, like if you bought this, it's rigid. To customize this into something else is very hard. But software, you can just move it anyhow. That's why software moves fast. You know, you have a phone, you have a new software update, it's fresh. Like it's like a, you know? So this is where companies come in, like how do you now take these pieces and integrate them and localize them for our local context? Keeping in mind our challenges. Because people who are developing this are probably not, it's not even efficient for them to start focusing on internet downtime when that is not even an issue for their major markets. Now, this is where we build customized software or customized hardware, or customize the hardware that we buy in a way that it works for our context. And when internet gets better, it gets better. And while we have the challenges, systems continue to work. And uh, last point about the disadvantages of internet. Um, apart from like, uh, uh, you know, f spreading false information, that kind of stuff. I think we should know and be aware that the social media platforms that we use are deliberately designed to be addicting. Mm. Period. Mm -hmm. Deliberately designed to be addicting. Mm. And it's eroding essentially our social fabric. And we should use these. There are so many positive things that we can do. But I think, for example, having a five-year-old or a 10-year-old 
on social media and getting addicted to TikTok is some serious, something really serious. Actually, some researchers are saying that if you give a five, a, your child less than five years old a tablet to play games and TikTok and whatnot, it's more like you're, you're giving them cocaine. Mm. Because there's, there's a chemical in the brain, um, no, it's not a neuroscientist, but chemical in the brain called dopamine that gets released you know, in terms of pleasure, right? And so if you, if you, you know, if you, if you're playing a video game, you get stimulated, you get happy, and dopamine gets released. And if you sniff cocaine, you, dopamine gets released. If you smoke weed, maybe, dopamine gets released, and you get really happy. Mm -hmm. But then when you get a like, and you have a share of your, of your stuff, or you're playing a video game, mm -hmm. these things are designed to be constantly stimulating, and this is very dangerous for our younger people. And look, look, today, I can't stay away from my phone. So does most of my friends. And when did we start using a phone? Maybe like a decade ago, a decade and a half ago, Max. Now imagine somebody who started five years. Disaster. So we really should pay attention to this. Now, I don't agree with this, but in China, you know, they put a ban on when you can play video games. Yeah, and because they were, this is based on data, though. I mean, it's not like I agree with this, but this is based on research that they have done. And they have seen how much impact this is having on their society. Because this is not like the game was good and you liked it, that's why you keep using it. The, the way it was designed, there's a fundamental flaw in us as human beings. You know, it's like they create a feedback loop that makes it addicting, it's deliberate. So we have to use the system against itself by using it as a reward system. That's my belief. Like, if you have kids, um, instead of saying, no, 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 you can't play video games, that would probably be worse. But maybe set a time for video games and make it as a reward system when they do the things that they are actually supposed to do. And you reward them with the video game, as opposed to just constantly 24 seven getting, getting addicted to this and not being able to distinguish this is the weekend, this is when I'm supposed to play, and this is the school days when I'm supposed to study and do schoolwork. So this is one of the things I am really concerned about. I'm really, really concerned about it. And it's maybe strange coming from me, from tech, you would imagine. But my belief is you should not give any child under five years old a tablet. That's the philosophy, that's the, that's the school of thought I follow. <laughs> Thank you, Hassan, uh, Mr. Hassan Jala. It was great having you on the Tap Hub today, mm -hmm. sharing your experience with us. And yes, me, Mr. Yai, uh, this was a very interesting conversation. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, and uh, Mariama. And um, please don't forget to subscribe to our channel, um, which is Mustafa Jai Dash Taf, or follow us on all our social media handles. Mm -hmm. Until we come again your way, I am Mustafa Jai, aka Youthman, <laughs> and my beautiful co-host Mariama Koli. Thank Hassan, you. thanks for coming. Thank my you. pleasure. Thank you. Tough Africa Global presents the first eco smart city in the Gambia, the Tough City. Located between Gunjur and Sifo, it is 30 minutes away from the Banjul International Airport. At Tough City, you will be able to live, work, play, and shop in a healthy multi purpose community. This vibrant urban environment will meet your everyday needs with commercial, business, recreational, and other complementary services to increase the value of your home. With up to 5,000 units of affordable homes on a 500 hectare land, Tap City will be twice the size of Banjul. Prime location, stunning properties, and amazing discount of 20% for the first 50 buyers. Make an appointment today to secure your property. For more information, please call plus 220-776233 or plus 220-376-2333 or you can send an email to info at toughafricaglobal.com. Better still, visit our office at Madiwa Mall, Brewfoot Gardens Estate. Tough City, a green and smart city, accessible to all.